of 1 Corinthians chapter 3, starting at verse 1. And I, brethren, Paul's talking Corinthians. I want you to notice how he greets them in the third chapter here. And I, brethren, I could not speak unto you as unto spiritual, but as unto carnal, even as unto babes in Christ. I have fed you with milk and not with meat. For hitherto ye were not able to bear it, neither yet now are ye able. For ye are yet carnal. For whereas there is among you envying and strife and divisions, and are ye not carnal and walk as men? I want to preach to you tonight, what are we really doing? That's what's on my heart tonight. What are we really doing? Let's pray. Lord, I love you, Jesus. Lord, I thank you for your grace, Lord. I pray that this message is yours. Lord, I pray that it's your delivery and your words and not, not mine. I rebuke any hindrance or distraction, God. I pray that every heart hears it, Lord, and they deal with it as you would have them deal with it, Lord. Thank you, Jesus, for what you're going to do. In your holy name we pray. Amen. You may be seated. I want you to be clear. I want you to understand clearly again that when I say, "What are we doing?" I'm saying "we" as in the Pentecostals of the wit. A lot, most a lot of times I'll speak collectively as church as a whole society or whatever. But no, I'm talking about our little congregation of thirty people, depending on what mood they're in. That's who I'm talking about right now. When I say doing, I'm referring to what are we doing in our church lifestyle, our church culture, our culture, the things that we do. What? That's what I'm asking. What are we really doing? Tonight is going to be an attempt to a higher calling. I believe that there, we have reached a plateau and God is no longer satisfied with good enough and it's time for us to take another step up closer. And that is the attempt tonight. Now, let me be just a little bit carnal with you for a second. I do love the game of football. I no longer watch the sport as much. I don't. I used to have season tickets for a season there to raise it back. Um, that was a long time ago. I, I guess around 2008, maybe 2009. It's, it's been that long, okay? And it got to a point where my spirit was affected by whether or not the Hogs won or lost. And I realized that was an issue. So I, I sought prayer and kind of fasted the, the, the sport for a little bit. And it doesn't bother me no more. And, and, and now with the NFL being silly with their politics, I'm just not interested in the NFL. But I still love the sport of football. It's the perfect team sport. You go out there with 11 players. See, you go out there in basketball with five players. And if you got one Michael Jordan, you may still win the game, no matter who else you have, because he's that good. You can go out, you can go out baseball and have nine players, but if you've got an ace pitcher, you stand a chance of winning because he, no one else can hit off of him. But if you go out there with eleven players in football, and if one of them does not do their job, somebody has a chance of getting hurt, much less winning or losing the game. If whether they miss a block, whatever. It takes all 11 to do their best. So I love that. Because that speaks volumes to the church. That speaks volumes. If one of us slacks off, we risk injury. We'll get to that in a minute. So anyway, I love a good football analogy. And I want to use, I want to compare our culture to a football week, if you will, to a week of football. Football practices, and I, let me, I guess this goes without saying, but I am referring to a good football team, okay? I'm referring to a team that's well-ran with a good coach and not some UAPB team, okay? I'm talking about a well-run machine. The Alabama, if you will, of college football. That, that, that's the, the, the team I'm talking about here. Their practices are brutal to the flesh. I mean, it is exhausting, the, the daunting tasks that they have to do, the hours they have to get up. And the, the players not only have to participate in the practices, but they have to prepare for the practices. 
the Razorbacks had a running back after Gary McFadden, Felix Jones, and Peyton Hills left. His name was Mike Smith, and boy, that boy ran hard. He ran like a man. When he got that ball, he didn't think about it. He didn't deal with that away. He charged that hole like he was a cut out of the can. The problem with Mike Smith is he was EB. He was about 5'10". If we're running back, that's short. So what Mike Smith had to do every morning, if practice started at 5, he was in the ice bucket at 4, getting his body ready for what had to be done at practice. Because he knew that his little B frame could not handle the grueling practice if he did not take care of it beforehand. Let that relate to our lifestyle in church. Are you preparing yourself for your Wednesday night services? Are you preparing yourself for your Sunday morning services? Are you preparing yourself for midweek, whatever we may have going on, or is it just something on your calendar and you, you get to it when you get to it? I can answer that question for you because it's blatant by who gets here early enough to pray before service. It is blatant by who gets here early enough with a good spirit of worship. I can tell you real quick, not many of us in this house prepare ourselves for church. Let's just be honest about it. Some of the songs that we've been singing, we've been singing for two years now, and you still don't know the words. You are not preparing yourself for church. Because if you want it to be included in the worship, you all have access to the internet. It's not hard to Google the lyrics of the songs that Miranda sings every other week. She's going to sing the same song. It's not hard to Google it. These are things that we need to do to prepare ourselves to get the best at practice. Because you know what happens if we don't give our best at practice? We give our poor at war. I know you've heard me say it. You're going to hear me say it for as long as I'm here. I promise you. Practice does not make perfect. Practice makes permanent. The Navy teaches you that you fight like you train. If you practice lazy, you're going to fight lazy. Football teams, they, they, they make their practices hard for a reason. They have two a days for a reason, or they used to, but now they're making it softer. The goal was to create endurance so that when you go out, you can still not just last for four quarters, but give your best for four quarters. And then, so you, it's not just that you can extend to the end, but perform at a high level. No dragging across to the, to the last whistle. Sprint to the last whistle. And oh man, what about overtime? If you follow the Razorbacks, we love overtime. Multiple games, we went to overtime seven times. Woo! I remember it was an NFL walk, AFC game, Dolphins and Steelers. Oh, there's sudden death over time there. They had to keep going. And they were so exhausted. The players that were on the sideline were on oxygen. The players that were on the field would no longer go to the sideline. It was easier to stay there and fight the next day than it was to run the, the 30 yards to the sideline. They refused to take that room. And when the whistle blow, they'd lean on each other. But it's exhausting. And we have to do that. Don't you understand that church service is not about getting to see each other. It's not about a check and a block of what we're supposed to do. But it's about building endurance in our spirit. So that when we are tried, we, we say, no, 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 devil. I have been there. I, I, I'm not worn out. I'm not tired yet, devil. And don't you see, I've been practicing my worship. I've been practicing my praise. You ain't got no weakling here, hallelujah. You know people that we say, they don't ever show up to church. They're your next victim, not this guy, because I have been coming to practice. That's why we practice every day. And by me, by all means, we should be practicing every day. If you think church is a two-day or week event, you're doing it wrong in your easy prey. If you're not praying throughout the week, you're failing. If you are not fasting, you're failing. And we wonder 
why we don't see miracles like we used to. And we wonder why there's no tongues of interpretation as often as there used to be. Because we're not putting in the effort. We're wanting the same God, but we want weaker requirements. No, sir. No, sir. You get what you put in. You put in no effort, you'll get nothing back. And that, that's contrary to our message that you hear so often. Man, we get excited. And, and I'll even say it, and people will take it out of context. But we get excited about the idea that we're not responsible for the results. God is responsible for the results. I know that. I admit that. I preach that. Yeehaw. But we think that uh, removes us from responsibility. It doesn't. Just because he's responsible for the results does not mean we get off scot free. For example, part of our game, if you will, I'm going to refer to the game, not that life and death is a game, matter of a game, I'm just using it for the sake of analogy, but part of the game is sowing the seed and winning souls. We cannot just throw it out there and say, well, well responsibility is God. I did my part. Oh, they didn't grow. Must have been bad seed. Must have been bad ground. 40 ground. Yeah, that's right. No, 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 no. We have to cultivate it. The Bible says to sow it and not just sow it, but we got to sow it in tears. When you sow that seed to that person, you better go back and get her name. And then you got to weep over her. Lord, this is her name. Lord, I need her. You need to build a relationship with that person at the gas station. You need to learn their parents' name. Get a hold of them. You got to sow that seed. You can't just throw it out there and say it's God's responsibility now. We got work to do. And if we don't do that, what are we really doing? Does that make sense tonight? What are we really doing if we're not doing it right? I think what has happened, going back to the football analogy, it's easier for them because every week they've got a game. They've got a target. They know who they're preparing for. But we sometimes lose sight of that target. When we lose sight of our target because we do it all year round. We don't have seasons, if you will. Okay? We don't have the, the draft. Wouldn't it be neat if we could draft up and come and say, who I want that one? Do a scout report. <laughs> but because we we don't have somebody with a, a chalkboard and the strength and weaknesses of the next team and because we don't see that, we lose sight of our purpose. And when we lose sight of our purpose, we lose sight of our motivation. And when we, when our motivation gets tampered with, we fail. Regardless of our habits. If we never miss a service, and I need to say this because I'm going to harp on attendance a lot because I believe in church attendance. If you never miss a service, but you don't do anything else right. You're failing. If we as a church, no one ever misses a service. I'm not, I'm just saying that as an example here. If our musicians never miss another key, well, that'd be neat, wouldn't it? <laughs> and let's say y'all got excited and felt, and, and you felt like clapping for once. Pretending that you're a Pentecostal church and wanted to actually demonstrate your worship. It doesn't matter if you do that or not. If we've lost our motivation on why we're here and why we're doing what we're doing. Because we're not just here to sing and clap. That's part of it. That's part of our practice. See, as football players, they got all their skills and their drills. They got all their things they have to do. And it's for the sake of betterment. So we've got singing, we've got clapping, we've got attendance, we've got amen, we've got praying, we've got offerings, we've got tithes. We, those are all of our efforts. Those are our drills. Those are what makes us better. Our Bible readings. Those are the things that we have to do to be better, to get to know Him better. But if, if we don't do that, or if we just do it nonchalantly, 
mechanically, and there's no love behind it, then we're just making noise. That's what the Bible says. As clean brass, our voice is gone and I've still got a lot to go. That's in, when you're preparing in your week of practice. Like I said, you're, pre you're preparing for an enemy. And I mentioned those things there, our singing, our clapping, our attendance, the amens, the praying, the offerings, the tithing, and the Bible reading. How hard are you practicing? What are, what are we really doing here? If, if this is the minimum, Maybe we're not winning our battles because we're, we're training like snot. I'm, I'm not here to black anybody's eye. But I'm not here to make you feel good either. Praise God for conviction. How sorry would it be if there was no conviction? If God said, okay, you can stay that way. But he loves us enough to say you're better than that. So we've got to grind. We've got to grit our teeth. We have to get dirty. You got to break a sweat. I, I got something that's going, that's going to blow some of your minds. And I got my eyes closed. So I don't want anybody. Matter of fact, I'm going to look at my wife because I'm not talking about her, but this way you can't say I'm talking to you. You're supposed to be exhausted when you leave church. You're supposed to be tired. Wore out from worshiping. Wore out from running. It, now, does the Bible say anything about running the aisles? Absolutely not. Do people run the aisles and it's just a show? Absolutely. Am I asking you to run the aisles? No way, Jose. I'm asking you to put something into your church experience. I'm asking you to get excited and demonstrate it some way. Something more than just nodding your head and saying, boy, look at that person go, they're really getting it. I'm looking for somebody who's got enough Holy Ghost in their own spirit to say hallelujah. I need somebody who you got it. And if you don't do these things, then what are we really doing? People can come and be with go to any church in this city and find somebody just sitting there. They need somebody Who's got the Holy Ghost that can get a hold of them? Why in the world would they want what we've got when we don't have anything different than anybody else? Hey. But like I said, maybe, maybe, let me get my mind straight. I got excited, got dizzy. Praise God. Like I said, it's not just what we do here in a church service. Because more people sure know how to play church and to go home and live the devil. It's what you do at home. In football, you only play once a week, but in this game, you play at any moment. You can be having a regular day. The Bible talks about walking in the Spirit. Because you never know when God says, game on, the devil's here. I remember... No one else is going to If anyone else remembers this, it may be Brandon. Kansas State uniforms are blue on blue. And they were playing in the field and they did their homework and the end zone was blue. So the other team kicked off to them. And the, the boy caught it. And he ran about five yards, turned around, and threw a lateral pass to a kid that nobody knew was there. And he made 34 yards down the field before he finally got tackled. And the announcer was like, where did he come from? He was laying down in the end zone with his blue on blue, laying on the blue turf. They did their homework, and they said, we've got to try this. And sure enough, they didn't even see him. They kicked to the one returner they saw. And they all ran to him and said, oh. So, I'm telling you, the devil can hide. And you know what? I want to say something you may not like it. And I 
and I need you to hear what I'm saying, and I don't mean it like your kids are possessed, but sometimes the devil hides in your kids. That without possessing them, he can hide in their attitudes. He can hide in their obligations. Whatever keeps consistently keeps you out of church. Whatever consistently interrupts your prayer life. He can hide in your jobs. He can hide in your spouse. He can hide in your friends. See, we're not looking for a boogeyman. That's what we picture when we think about the devil. Something big and gross and ugly. But realistically, it's something that we want. It's something that would actually entice us. That's where we're going to find them, is in our temptations. Going back to the football analogy, not only are the practices in preparation, but each practice and each week was tailor-made for the next particular game. Some teams, can, you can't run on them. They got the nickname the Iron Wall, the Iron Sheep. Well, you just can't run past them. However, you can throw on them all day long. So in that case, you would work on your passing offense. Okay, they can't stop the pass, we're going to work on that. Or vice versa. Or maybe they can't block. Or maybe they got one particular cornerback who can do this, but they can't do that. Maybe they got a linebacker who's really not the best at this. So you study and you prepare and you get a game plan for that one particular team. That's what a good team does. Don't you know? I need you to pay attention. That's what every Sunday school lesson and sermon is about. Tailor-made preparation for your next enemy. One-on-one. You guys are really sweet to me. And I'm just being transparent. One-on-one. You guys are really sweet. You've given me a lot of compliments, a lot of support. I'm going to call you out on it then. If you truly believe that I'm the man of God that's supposed to be here, because I tell you, I pray over the services. I pray, and like right now, this was nothing. I did not have this written this morning. This was something God put on my heart in a hurry after lunch. I didn't even have this written when I sent that text out to everybody. Okay? That's when he was laying it on my heart. So if you truly believe that God is putting these things in my heart, then let me ask you why you miss so much church. If it's a God-given message, what is so important that you can risk it? I like that silence. You chew on it. Because I need you to remember what I said before. I don't believe in 100% attendance. So I'm not telling you that there's no good reason to ever miss church. I'm telling you to be able to look out for that thing that constantly gets you out of church. Nothing is worth constantly missing church. Not a marriage. Not a child. Not a boyfriend. Not a girlfriend. Nothing is worth your relationship with God. And if you think for one second that you can live without the church, then I know you have not read your Bible. Because he is the head of the church. And if you think you're going to date a headless person, or maybe he's all head and no body, that doesn't work out. So if these are truly specific, God laid it on the pastor's heart, then you need to reconsider those things that constantly pull you away. Oh, but Brother Ace, we got it online. You might for now. I'm going to, well, I'll talk to one pastor in section. He's seriously considering getting rid of his online services. People getting too used to not coming to the house of God because they can default to online. It's not the same. It's not. You can't fellowship with one another. That's part of it too, building a relation with each other. There's a certain chemistry that warriors build when they fight with each other. You can't build that through the internet. So again, I'm not condemning you for 
for missing a service. I'm condemning you for missing a lot of services. Whoever that may fall to. Missing church may have become part of your practice and you fight like you train. Maybe you can't fight the devil because you've missed all the lessons. You ever go to a, a school's band concert? You can always tell a kid that didn't go to school a whole lot. Because that's the one flute that's out of tune. That's the one trumpet. You can tell the one kid don't know what they're doing because they ain't been showing up. Like I said, the warriors, they build a chemistry. They build a rhythm when you fight together. And some of us are showing up and it's obvious that you're not in sync with your brothers and sisters in this army of Christ. You're not in sync with us. You're not in harmony with us. Even if you've got the skill, you're not in harmony. And it's just not the same. You're going to get us in trouble. It's like the Spartan army and the Roman army, they would build that wall with their shield. And there's always that one guy, or there would be that one guy who didn't hold it just right and left a hole in their wall. That's you trying to fit in as a soldier and you've not been doing your part with the training. You don't know what to do. You ain't been listening to the sermons. You ain't been worshiping with us. You ain't been working out. And now you're just a weak fledgling of what should be a strong army of God. I need you to understand it's not just about the attendance. Because you know you don't get points for showing up. You get points for showing out. It's what you do while you're in attendance. It all matters. And if it doesn't matter, then what are we really doing? And if it does matter, then what are you really doing? The wins and the losses in these games, they matter. They matter. In some leagues, one loss and you're done. You have no hope of winning the title anymore. It's because your conference is weak and you needed a perfect, a flawless schedule. But I remember New England Patriots going 17 0. Oh, this is one of my favorite stories. I don't like New England Patriots. 17 0. There's only been one perfect team in the NFL, and that was the Miami Dolphins in like 78, whatever. Tom Brady thought he was going to do it. He went through the playoffs. He went through the AFC championship. Now they're, and they're fighting. It's a wild card Giants team. Shouldn't have even been there. Eli Manning, who was nowhere near the caliber quarterback of Tom Brady. Don't you know the New England lost that game? 17 and 1! The Giants finished 10 and 7. <laughs> but they were Super Bowl champs. Champs because they won when it mattered. They won when it mattered. How does this work? There's more. K Kentucky did the same thing in basketball. And I, I, I love my pastor, but he's born and, red, born and red, raised in Kentucky. He loves his Kentucky basketball. And boy, I made a nice little article in the church bulletin when they went undefeated all the way to the National final game and lost it. The Rays that just did that. They went all baseball season, didn't lose a single series until the Super Regionals, and they lost to Kansas State, North Carolina State. It doesn't matter how good your season. How about the Buffalo Bills? Four Super Bowls in a row. No other team has done that. But they're not known for the greatness of four Super Bowls in a row. They're known for losing four Super Bowls in a row. What's the equivalent of that? The equivalent of that is showing up to church every day, but never coming to an altar. You're, you're, you're winning your season, but you're losing when it counts. Or you come to an altar and you say a lame prayer. Thank you, Lord, for everything you've done for me. Forgive me, Lord, if I got anything wrong. Appreciate you. Bless, bless the Lord. Thank you. <laughs> Brother Mike, I'm just not emotional. Yes, you are. Everybody is emotional. They're just selective with their emotions. I've seen grown men sit dry-eyed through every church service. 
But let them reel in a 10 pound bass. Or a picture shooting an 18 point buck and the bullet kills it but ricochets off the skeleton into another buck. Now you got an emotional man. What if I was to tell Mr. No Emotions that somebody won the lottery but they put your name on the ticket? Now we got emotions. But when it comes to this stuff, I'm just not emotional. We're selective with our emotions and we need to be careful about what we're really doing. In our opening text, It says, and I, brethren, could not speak of you as into spiritual. I wanted to talk to you spiritual matters. I had other things I wanted to say, but I couldn't because you're too carnal. <coughs> How many needful things have we missed? How, let me use my pronouns correctly. How many needful things have the members of the Pentecostals of DeWitt missed because the members of the Pentecostals of DeWitt were not ready to hear it? What if God had wanted to share unto us spiritual, but he couldn't because we're carnal? Maybe the answer to some of your hurts were put on hold because we just wouldn't grow up. How can you tell if you're a grown up? First way is by how easily you get offended. If you get your feelings hurt, you're, you're immature. I'll tell you that right now. How easily you get distracted and knocked off track. How hard you're working during practice. Let me tell you another sign that needs to be brought up. You can tell if how mature you are by who offends you. Because not everybody likes correction. Whether it's <clears throat> from their boss at work, from a fan, someone... A, Wherever for an pastor, I need you to think about Saul and David. Saul would have rather used physical weapons to kill the anointed man of God than he would have rather used spiritual weapons to kill the problems in his own self. It was easier to grab a spear and throw it at David than it was for him to fall on his face and repent for being a prideful man. Anytime someone is attacking the anointed, it's because they have not crucified their flesh. Hebrews 5 and 12. For when the time ye ought to be teachers, ye have need that one teach you again, which be the first principles of the oracles of God, and are become such as have need of milk, and not of strong meat. Oh, did I? Yeah. For everyone that uses milk is unskillful in the word of righteousness, for he is a babe. But strong meat belongeth to them that are of full age, even those who by reason of use have their senses exercised to discern both good and evil. He says, for when ye, this time ye ought to be teachers, he says, you should have been teachers by now. I expected more from you by now. You should be doing more by now. If it was a physical relationship, you would slap that bottle out of your mouth. You ever seen a 12-year-old still sucking on their thumb? Slap it out of your mouth. They're too old for that. That's what he's saying. Get that pacifier out of their mouth. Make that kid grow up. That's what he's saying. For as you ought to be teachers, you're still drinking the milk. And I wonder if that applies to our assembly today. And if it does, how many people are we failing? Because he says, if we're supposed to be teachers, then that means there's people we're supposed to be teaching. And if we're not reaching them, the ones we're supposed to be reaching, then what are we really doing? Again, my goal is not to make you feel bad, it's to make you feel convicted. Conviction hurts. 
I told you this lifestyle isn't easy on the flesh. I'll pat you on the back later. I told someone recently that I do tend to try to balance it out. After one hard one, I'll come back with a soft rainbow one later. I'll balance it out later. But right now, we need to feel the pain of reality. What are we really doing? Are we making a difference? And if not, why? Or are we just satisfying our tradition? 1 John chapter 2, verse 12. I write unto you, little children, because your sins are forgiven you for his name's sake. I write unto you, fathers, because ye have known him that is from the beginning. I write unto you, young men, because ye have overcome the wicked one. I write unto you, little children, because ye have known the Father. I have written unto you, fathers, because ye have known him that is from the beginning. I have written unto you, young men, because ye are strong, and the word of God abideth in you, and ye have overcome the wicked one. It's important, the distinctions here. He says little children twice, but those are actually two different words. One was referring to the infant, and one was referring to the little kid. When he says young man, he's referring to the immature, your adolescence, if you will. And when he's talking about father, he's talking about the full-grown man. So he's describing the different levels of spiritual growth. We have to acknowledge that there is a spiritual growth chart. And oh, how easy it would be if I could just get so full of the Spirit, I could walk over, oh, little Brandon, you're right here. And last year, you were way down here. And, we, and then, after a couple of years, we go, oh, look how well he's grown. But we, we don't get to lay it out like that. But that chart does exist in God's eyes. And he is looking at that. I know that everyone grows at a different, spiritually, everyone grows spiritually at a different rate and different pace. But again, we abuse that and take it for granted. Anything that does not grow is sick or deformed. Right? If you have a child and you don't have to buy a new size shirt for them for six years, you don't tell the doctor, well, we all grow at a different rate. No, they're concerned about what disease this kid has and why he's not growing out of that shirt. Do not get comfortable in your little bitty onesies, spiritual onesies, because you think you look cute as a newborn. It's time to grow up and be a church. The motions of a church service is one thing, and then it gets more personal. I tried to build a relationship with each of you at a different level. Different, some of you are easier than others. Some are more convenient than others due to uh, timing, location, whatever. But I tried to talk to you or whatever and get a feel for you. I, some of you uh, I've given responsibilities to. Some I've asked to do this, some I've asked to do that. What I'm trying to do is trying to teach you that there's more than just pew warming. This whole process is called discipleship. You ever heard that word? Discipleship is not a new word. But discipleship is hard. It's hard for me. I was accused of being... You didn't know this. I had someone tell me their suggestion advice to me was to quit being too nice. I was told that I'm too soft. <laughs> Do y'all know how many times he tells me I'm too mean? It's hard. Everybody's different. And let's be honest. And I, I don't mean this negatively, but I'm just being
being transparent. These are things that your pastor struggle with. There are so many things that needs help. Okay, there are so many things. Where do I start? And I'm praying, I'm taking one step at a time. But it gets a little overwhelming sometimes when it all shows up the head at once. And I'm not telling you, I'm, I'm just being honest, telling you the, the hardship from my side as discipleship, because I also still need to be discipled. I am in constant communication with my pastor, telling, giving him a report of what I'm doing. I have my own authority that I'm answering to. Give advice. I talk to Brother Hedden. I'm, I'm submissive to my authorities. But this is hard. Sometimes we disciple in groups, and sometimes we disciple individually. And if I'm teaching indiv individually, what, what am I teaching you? Well, that depends. Some of you, i, I got to teach, uh, it's really basic. I'm still trying to teach you why you need to be baptized in Jesus' name. Some of you are a little more mature, and I'm teach, teaching you the insights of ministry, okay? And I'm doing the best I can, trying to work with those who are willing to be worked with, those that are responding. And some of you are not responding. Some of you have got your reasons and whatnot, and blah, 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 blah. But you know what would happen if everyone in this church started to grow spiritually? If everyone in this church started to actually grow into disciples, we would never need a fundraiser again. I need you to think about that. The greatest fundraiser any church has ever seen is discipleship. For one, it increases giving based on, on offerings and tithing. Some people in the church don't know the difference. They think one is, a, they think they're the same. They are not. They're two different things. So when you neglect one, you, you're, you're neglecting. That's all the thing I got to teach on. However, another part of discipleship is that it is contagious. Because you have matured into a disciple, now you're bringing in other people. And now you're discipling other people. And that's how we grow. And the more we're in, we put in pews and the less fundraising we have to do to take care of things. So instead of the few that are financially supporting, trying to do everything, let's win some souls and do this together. But that's part of discipleship. And that's what we're doing. Or what are we really doing if we're not discipling? I'm not asking you for perfection. I'm asking you to maintain the striving for perfection. I don't believe in excuses. I don't believe in, well, Brother Mike, ain't nobody perfect. You're right. Okay, even though the Bible names other people perfect besides Jesus, even though the Bible says be perfect as your Father in heaven is perfect. And I know we all make our mistakes, and I'm not here to crucify nobody over the mistakes, but I am here to convict you over your lifestyle of living that way. Get over yourself and your failures and your excuses and grow up. Growth comes from personal accountability. Hold yourself accountable. This is not going to work. God needs better from me. My brothers and my sisters at church, they deserve better from me. And you'll get there. We do all grow at, this, at different rates and there's no such thing as instant maturity. No new convert is ready to preach the next day. It's a growth process. Quit complaining about the struggles in your life. Quit complaining about how much pressure you under. A diamond is just a chunk of coal that is made good under pressure. I read a quote, and I'm getting ready to close. Finally, someone, I felt someone still... A pastor shared this, and he didn't share it in public. He shared it in moment, and I'm probably the only one dumb enough to share it with the, with the church. But that's, I told you, I'm transparent, I'm honest. He said, pastors, some people help you pull the weight. Some people walk alongside while you pull the weight. And others are the weight. Let me read that to you again. Some people help you pull the weight. Some people walk alongside while you pull the weight, while you pull the weight, and others are the weight. 
And then some, somebody liked it so much that they replied with this little nugget. The key to growth is to find or develop more of the first kind than the last kind. Find or develop more that will help you pull it than, than you do find those that are the way. I'm not asking anybody to leave because you think I called you dead weight. I'm asking us to do a self-reflection and be honest with yourself. Are you helping pull the weight or are you the weight? Or are you just walking beside while someone else is doing the work? Which one are you? What are we really doing? Are you really supportive? You know, <laughs> and I know most of the people that are watching online have good reasons, okay? Some of them, like I said, they're a family vacation that's much needed and deserved. And I encourage that. Here in July, my family will abandon me on the 4th of July and go on a vacation without me, okay? So I'm not condemning anyone on vacation. Some are struggling with doctor's appointments. or I'm not condemning it. You don't know. I'm not aiming at any different person. But there is a funny trend. I love that you all respect me enough to text me and tell me when you're not going to be here. Most of you do. Okay? I've asked you to do that, and you, and you do that. And other pastors are amazed that you do that. Y'all are awesome. But I, I've noticed that when you tend to miss a lot, <laughs> I tend to get more fluff. We're going to be gone again, but we love you. We support you. I'm going to be real honest. I know you, some of you may be doing a good reason, but you can't support me from home. I don't need you at home. I need you here. You can't do jack for us there. Because the things you could do from there, you've been able to do for years and you ain't done it yet. You, you could have cash out us some money. You could have uh, tied me. You could have helped out something. You could have you could have done something, and you ain't done it yet. Only two people do the electronic financial support. So I, I, that's why I'm saying you ain't done it yet. One person uses Sizely, and one person uses Cash App. You can't support me from home. And you show up for worship, but are you really worshiping? And I hope you understand that I love you. And I'm not saying this because I woke up on the wrong side of the bed. I'm saying this because God slammed my heart heavy. That we, as in this assembly, need to evaluate what we're doing. Let's stand. Bow our heads, please. I need you to know that how you respond to this message is critical. Let's go back to Adam and Eve. What was Adam's major crime? Brother Mike, he ate the fruit. While that is bad, was it truly the worst? I think there was more to it than just him eating the fruit. Because God didn't immediately punish him. For eating the fruit. God punished him when he came to the garden and Adam was hiding from him. So you see, with the fruit came the knowledge of good and evil. And with, with the fruit, they realized their shame. How you handle this conviction is going to matter to God. You can try to hide from him, or you can come boldly before the throne of grace to find help in time of need. Here we are. We're all asked, myself included, are being asked to line up and see if we're growing up as, as Christians or if we're just wasting time. We can respond or we can hide. I hope that we all respond. Let's pray.